you know, one thing I think if you think about the context of the conversation we've had today at Project Play, that we've talked a lot about, um, especially the don't retire kid theme, a lot about the demand side of youth sports, right? How parents, how kids are thinking about this. Uh, and I think today's conversation will be a lot about the supply side, right? These organizations that are actually delivering sports programming, in some case, actually being the professional leagues and teams. We're gonna explore three questions over the course of this conversation. The first is the why, right? Why are community organizations, why are community leagues struggling? Why are professional leagues and teams getting involved? Then we're gonna talk about the how. How are professional leagues and teams impacting the capacity, impacting community organizations and community sports? And ultimately, what? What can we learn from it? What inspiration can we take from it? What lessons can we learn? And then ultimately, uh, what, what can we do about it as we leave this conversation? So starting to my left, uh, we've got Chris Frischling from the Detroit Lions. He is the director of football education. Been with the Lions for 16 years. I've um, been coaching football for 26 years. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Thank you. We have Laura Dixon from the San Antonio, uh, the head of external relations uh, at the Spurs Sports and Entertainment, uh, responsible for over four professional teams uh, in the context of her work in community. Uh, and she's also on the board and involved with way too many community organizations in San Antonio to get involved with, but brings a really unique perspective to this conversation. Uh, to her left is David James, who is the Vice President of Baseball and Softball Development at Major League Baseball. He's been there for 11 years and brings experience from Little League Baseball before that as well. And then last but not least, we have Andrew Ferentz from the NHL. He is the Director of Social Impact, Growth, and Fan Development. He also spent 16 years in the league, including hosting the, uh, the Stanley Cup when he was with the Bruins as a Stanley Cup champion. So welcome, all of you, today. Thank you. Thanks. So, so let, let's jump into it. I think the first question is, is, is why? Why are community leagues struggling? Why is community sports struggling? I'll start with you, Chris. What's your take? You know what, I, I've had the opportunity over the last couple um, weeks actually to, to, to do some informal um, evaluation of, of youth football in and around our, our greater Metro Detroit area. And, and, and it's interesting to me what I found in, in the small subset of, of information that I've, I've gathered is that um, the practices that I'm attending, the kids aren't having fun. And, and it's unfortunate that, that it, it's being presented to the kids in that manner. And, and, and and, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, more later. And, and la uh, later on, I know there's a, a topic on this, but, but the education of the coaches and understanding how to make it fun for kids, understanding how to uh, teach an 8-year-old compared to a 12-year-old, understand how to put a practice plan together. Um, I, I think a lot of times it, it's a situation where, where kids are, are maybe experiencing a community uh, uh, league, and they're not having the fun, so they're trying these travel options. And, and as we know, with, as we've talked about, the travel options can be can be rather pricey, and there's more um, more pressure on those kids and so forth. And 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 bottom line, it's got to we got to get back. We got to get back to making it fun for the kids. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, whether it's community or travel, um, youth sports is going down the wrong path. Yeah, and we'll get into a lot of those issues. I appreciate that, Laura. What, what's your perspective? What are some of the challenges that you're seeing? Um, with community leagues that's that's prompting so much involvement from the from the Spurs? Um, well, you know, we have been involved in youth sports since Pop was an assistant coach, and he had the vision, you know, as he, you know, per usual, does, and started the Midnight Basketball League 30 years ago. Um, so we've been invested in youth sports and youth basketball, and it looks a lot different now. I mean, he's not walking into downtown San Antonio at midnight with his assistant coaches, just playing pickup games in the way that they did 30 years ago. Um, but the investment in infrastructure has become so important um, as the communities that, you know, that we serve, all of our major metro areas, um, having places for kids to play, uh, you know, that's changing. The populations are growing and the number of places that are safe and, you know, that kids have access to when they want to play is is part of the challenge so you know we we take inventory we look at what needs we have in our community and we work to invest in those so there's there's challenges about where the infrastructure questions there's there's challenges of how these organizations are actually operating at a time when kids kids expectations may be continuing to shift david what's your take what are some of the patterns that you're seeing well i think communities? i think like everyone else it's the cost it's the access and also embracing uh you know sort of underneath the play ball campaign however you play ball play ball 
Um, we understand that there is, you know, a market out there for the competitive side, but also, you know, what about the kid who just enjoys the game and is comfortable with whatever their playing ability is? And then the big thing for us with our sport too, I think one of the biggest challenges is making sure kids have access to play all summer long with the tournament, the travel base, that everything is over the course of the weekend. And from our perspective in baseball and softball, it's a hard sport and repetition is important. And the only way you're gonna do that is, you know, when the kids aren't in school, let's make sure that we're giving them programming that they're constantly engaging in the sport. Right, and, and you take that, if there's a need for constant programming and you have under-resourced organizations that may have a harder time getting space, then it's that much more challenging to figure that out, which obviously we'll talk about ways that you're, you're solving those gaps. Uh, Andrew, what, what's your take? What are, what are some of the challenges you see with community leagues? Well, I could obviously repeat the, the same things. I mean, access uh, and infrastructure is, is a huge issue. I know you guys have a tough time, but you would also don't have to play on frozen sheet of uh, water. So <laughs> access for hockey is a whole another level yes. of, of uh, actually playing ice hockey. Um, but to, to diverge a bit, it would be what we're hearing from a lot of parents is the time commitment as well. It's, I love the sport. I love playing. But the only program that's available, I have to be there five days a week, and it's on a different time each day of the week. And so, uh, you know, just scheduling-wise, I can't do it. And, and so I think sometimes it's the, uh, the actual programs that are available to people, um, especially at a, at a more casual level. Uh, we understand that not everybody wants to make the NHL. Some people just want to play hockey uh, for fun, one day a week, you know, maybe two days a week. But if there's not a quality uh, option of programming to, to fulfill those needs, yeah. where are they going to go? Uh, so that's, that's really been a lot more of our focus is, is providing uh, some higher quality casual programming. Yeah, in, in this discussion, too, you can see the interrelationship between a lot of the issues that I think the Aspen Institute has, has pointed out because the, the absence of free play, right, without introducing free play, now you're, st you're basically, you know, back when I was growing up, I was, you know, playing wiffle ball in my backyard, making up games. And, and if you lose that and now you're basically working within organized sports, then you're dealing with some organizations that just don't have the capacity to be able to deliver as, as maybe some other organizations. Um, maybe, David, we'll start with you. How, how and why are professional uh, leagues and teams engaging here. Why, why is Major League Baseball getting involved? Um, now that you've recognized some of these issues, um, what's, what's prompting your engagement? Well, I think credit to Commissioner Manford that uh, when he came on board, youth was his number one platform, that the game needed to get younger. Uh, we needed a much more diverse fan base, and there was a lot of communities across the country that weren't engaging in the game. Um, a lot of progress has been made, and quite honestly, uh, sort of one of the interesting byproducts from a club perspective, a major league club perspective, they are just as competitive off the field <laughs> as they are on the field. So as we started to push, you know, the play ball campaign and specifically the RBI program, Evolving Baseball in Inner Cities, um, the clubs really started to figure out, hey, we should take this brand internally in market. So it is uh, the Texas Rangers RBI program. It is the Los Angeles Dodgers RBI program. Kids are wearing their marks, they're playing, and they feel like they're part of the team and they're engaging and things like that, and they're developing a new fan base. And once one or two clubs started to do it, then we'd start to get the calls. Hey, well, you know, what are they doing and how can we get involved with that? And that's really mushroom. But implicit in, in the idea that, that diversifying your fan base uh, but through, through engaging in, in youth sports is, is suggesting that if kids are playing the game, then they're more likely to be a fan of the game. Is that, is that a fair assumption? A absolutely. And, and the other part of that is also, from our perspective, it's baseball and softball. When uh, our department name was changed to baseball and softball development, there was a lot of questions that folks said, you guys say softball. <laughs> yep, the girls are important to us also. Yeah. When, Laura, when you think about it from the Spurs perspective, you know, how are you, how are you all thinking about the, the why? Why are you getting involved here? And you mentioned, obviously, Pop had uh, this, this interest in, in the context of basketball. But, for example, you guys are involved now in soccer, and you, you're using the engagement in community sports as a big part of your strategy there. Indeed, um, and you know, I think in addition to fan development, it's a, you know, it's a responsibility we have, right? Um, we have people that have been part of our basketball family for a long time, uh, folks like Chris Dial, who's here today with the Basketball Embassy, and 
he, you know, grew up loving basketball. I think maybe had, you know, Spurs had something to do with that growing yeah. up in San Antonio. And now his organization is taking basketball to the world and coaching fundamentals, making the game better everywhere, you know, across the globe. And of course, we benefit from that because the talent pool, you know, is, is growing and further developed. Um, and and it makes our game better um, at the at the grassroots level where where we have you know played for a long time we certainly connect with with our fans and parents and partners that want to make those investments as well so it, it is holistic our our youth our our soccer team is our newest franchise and we started a micro league for just six to eight year olds and it's three weeks old so you know the the jury's still out on what that turns right. into and if it will have the same you know success and staying power that the Spurs youth basketball league has had but at the core we use the platform, you know, try to use it responsibly. The mantra for the Spurs Youth Basketball League forever has um, been, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, I can't remember right now. Well, we're gonna get, I wanna get into the Spurs Youth Basketball League, so I'll yeah. give you a second to reflect on that. Yeah. Um, Andrew, when you think about, we've talked, uh, Laura talked, I think, eloquently about the, the, the community investment that's, that's connected to this, and, and there's also a fan development piece as well that, that David elaborated on. How is the NHL approaching this? Why are you all getting involved, and how do you all think about the return on investment and getting involved in impacting community uh, programs? Well, there's a couple different levels. I mean, obviously, we need to develop fans and people that care about um, sports. I, I, I would take it even a little bit further to the point of, you know, the more somebody is interested in hockey, the more they're likely to become a fan. We take the approach, if you're interested in sports, there's a better chance that you're probably gonna be a fan. And we really do believe in the multi-sport approach and, and we think that hockey will you know, be a part of that ecosystem if we help push it. So we do invest in infrastructure. That's a big push to get into street hockey, to get into parks and recs departments, schools around the country, to have hockey as an actual option uh, alongside of all the great basketball rinks and our, our basketball courts and, and whatnot. We need hockey to just be an option for kids to go play. Uh, at a casual pace, like you said, like for the free play. Um, so that's, that's a huge push for us in, in that casual uh, form of play. But the other uh, very important part to us, uh, you know, of why the investment in the community side of it uh, is important is, is back to the hockey rinks uh, where, where kids play all their youth hockey. A lot of these are privately owned or municipally owned arenas that are quite frankly extremely expensive to run. Uh, and, and it's difficult to program them during school hours. It's difficult to, uh, to upgrade refrigeration uh, and some of the big upgrades you need for them. So they're expensive. And, and so for those um, uh, arenas to be viable and to be in their communities and, and stay open, they need to be doing good business. Part of their good business is adult hockey leagues and, and, and some of the late time slots they can fill with, uh, with you know, better revenue. It's hard to have adult rec leagues if you don't have kids that stay in the sport and continue to play until they're adults. So if we're seeing massive dropouts you know, at, at teenager years and, and, and kids not coming back to the sport to play, if we're having people with bad experiences that are leaving hockey and not coming back, the very base of, of where people play our games, those buildings now become non-viable. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and we lose that infrastructure. Right. It, it's interesting, and, and it, it seems like there's just a broader case, and, and I think that's the, the power of the strategic involvement of the leagues and teams is just the, the recognition that it impacts so many different underlying components of your, your business. Um, Chris, what's the NFL's perspective, and especially as an NFL team, how do you all think about why, why you're getting involved in, in, in youth football here in, uh, in, in Michigan? To us, it's pretty simple. Our, uh, we believe our job is to protect, promote, and grow this game. And we've got to create experiences in and around this game so that whether they're playing the game, whether they're somewhere down the road coaching the game, or whether they're watching the game, they're enjoying the experience. And, and, and so the ability, that, that is ultimately our underlying reason why we do what we do in, in, in not only the Detroit Lions, but the NFL as well. And so um, creating experiences and around the game where, where, where communities come together on a Friday night in, in, in high school football, where states come together to experience uh, a college football Saturday, and then hopefully down at Ford Field, you know, the experience that they have down there. Um, NFL talks about fam football as family all the time, and, and we really pride ourselves on being able to create experiences in and around that that, that families can remember that are ultimately going to want right. kids to be a part of our game. Why, why not just leave this work to the national governing bodies? Why does the, why does the pro team, why do you have to be involved? 
we, we, we're working in conjunction with right. entities like obviously the NFL and USA football to make, make sure that we make this game from top to bottom, from youth football to the pros, as good as it can be. And so, so we're working all in conjunction in, in those regards because I, we all have the same belief. So, so we now understand there's, there's a lot of reasons why you, you all are involved. And the fact that there's so many of them, I think makes this such a strategic priority. The question then is how, right? The, each of the models of your involvement is a, is a little bit different. Maybe we'll start with you, Chris. How, what, what is the kind of thrust of how you all are engaging? When, when we talk about these in-town leagues, these community organizations that may be struggling, what's the strategy you have when it comes to community sports? How do you approach it? You know, from, from our department standpoint, we, we focus on the education of the game with kids through our camp and clinic program. That's, that's our primary focus in what we do. The, the game of football is so fragmented in terms of the youth football space um, in that, uh, you know, most of the youth football organizations out there are independent leagues. Uh, but the NFL's done a, a really nice job of, of promoting NFL flag. And they've got a fairly new program called NFL Flag in Schools, where, which is, is going into schools that are underfunded and under-resourced to be able to pr provide opportunities for, for kids in, in, in the game. In fact, NFL Flag or Flag Football as a whole is, is one of the, the fastest growing sports of the last two, three years for that age six to 12 year old. And uh, it has since surpassed in numbers of participation, flag football has actually surpassed tackle football. So the, the emphasis on, on, on the flag part of, part of the game is really important. There's a number of our, 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 our local um, uh, national flag football and, and play for fun sports uh, organizations that conduct uh, leagues in, in, our, in our state of Michigan that do a great job of doing just that. And so um, that's where we involve, we get involved. Right. And, we want and, it, and it seems like the, the NFL flag, that, that model, it's really about your, your licensing a brand. So you're giving credibility to these organizations. In some cases, they're getting access to maybe some equipment, and, and, and we can talk a little bit later about some coaching education, and you're allowing them to actually run the programs. And Absolutely. so that model is more affiliation. David, I think Major League Baseball's approach is a little bit more, more, a, a little bit more varied. Mm -hmm. So how, what is the model that you all take when it comes to kind of the programs that you're running in, in, in the context of community sports? Well, there's a couple of different buckets, the grassroots side and the development side, but the overarching brand, of course, is play ball. And, and I'm uh, really working on the grassroots side, so whether it be play ball events that we're doing in uh, you know, communities all across the country, a uh, very casual, informal way of introducing kids to the game and the takeaway is every kid gets to go home with a Franklin play ball, bat and ball set. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to play in a league, then we have the RBI program, Revolving Baseball in Inner Cities. Uh, but also if it's uh, skills-based, uh, pitch hit and run or the Junior Home Run Derby, which an opportunity to advance all the way to the, uh, to the All-Star Game. But then on the development side now, um, there's infrastructure being built. There's nine youth academies. Uh, the commissioner's office operates two, one in New Orleans, the other one in Compton, California. We just uh, took over the lease of the former Dodger town in Vero Beach, Florida. That is now the Jackie Robinson Training Center. So we have physical locations that for those higher end kids um, that they can be developed. I know there was a conversation yesterday with the head coach from the University of Michigan and he's sort of identified as a pipeline <coughs> of kids and, and probably most importantly kids of color coming back to it. And then the, the mention about the governing bodies, um, our tentpole partners uh, on play ball is USA Baseball and USA Softball. And obviously for us, uh, next year is a huge year because both sports are back in the Olympics. Uh, USA Softball has al already qualified. Uh, the baseball side will start a little bit earlier. And then we're also seeing the, the social impact. Um, in our particular department, um, over the course of the summer, we'll do 40 events and we hire five interns. Four of the five interns this year were RBI alums that came from local leagues and we were really proud about that. So, and, and so that range of programming from creating a broader context of demand like play ball, which is the lowest threshold of participation, to working and building capacity of local community organizations, to actually running showcases or building out these academies, it seems like you've created, a, there's a range of different tactics for the level of your involvement. Uh, just to give some sense, how many, how many staff are working on your team? Uh, uh, it, this, this does not seem like an afterthought. Yeah, we are a staff of 25. Uh, when I started, we were a staff of four. So the, again, the level of commitment from baseball to, hey, we're in this for the long haul, we're growing. Um, one of the challenges now is obviously everybody in this room is very familiar with the safe sport law. Uh, so one of the things that we had to do, we hired a youth compliance officer to make sure all of this programming that, you know, all of the waivers are being signed and everyone who's involved 
understands what the guidelines are and how we have to take care of these kids that are participating in our programming. That's great. Um, Andrew, when you think about the NHL's approach here, what's the model of involvement? We've heard about affiliation. Uh, David presented a, a, a range of different ways that they're either building capacity of local organizations or building their own programming. What, what's the NHL's approach here? Well, I mean, uh, typically it's delivered through our clubs. Uh, you know, our learn to play program, uh, each club delivers that in their markets. Uh, and it actually, a lot of the funding from it comes from our, our collective bargaining agreement with the players union, uh, which is a pool of money uh, to grow the game. Uh, grow the game. It's called the industry growth fund. And so learn to play programs uh, are funded through that. Uh, and also the in-school programs that are run through EverFi, um, with the access to the schools to you know, teach STEM programming and link it to hockey uh, and, and some of the you know, different lessons you can learn from that. And then our, our you know, uh, leaders in that have, uh, have combined that with a street hockey component in, in physical education uh, programs within the school. So there's the two pathways of on the ice, learn to play, and getting kids involved with the game and introduced to the game. And then the street hockey component, which um, is my main focus at work, uh, which, which uh, can reach a, a broader group of, of kids. So that's all run through the, uh, through the teams. At a league level, we're trying to develop the programming and give a good template for these programs and, and lean on best practices so that we can share with those clubs and get more involved with USA Hockey, who is our governing body and our biggest partner, uh, to actually establish some, some real programming uh, to, com to combat what I talked about earlier, about a fun programming, lower commitment option for now you've been introduced to hockey and now you're interested in it and you want to keep playing um, but not jump to a you know, multi-thousand dollar you know, travel team where do I go? And right now there's not a ton of options for those <coughs> kids. And so that's uh, another big focus for us on the ice is working with a partner like USA Hockey who can get outside of our club markets and hit all those neutral sites where we need to grow the game. That's our, that's our, uh, our big thing. We do great in the markets, but all the places in between has got to be a much bigger focus for us. Laura, so there's, there's a range of models, and I think you, you talk about the Spurs. I mean, one of the things is, is Pop, Popovich is actively involved in these programs. Like, it seems like that's a huge way of differentiating a community program. If you want to make it fun, like, to get the, the organization really behind it, uh, really creates a unique proposition that, that, that really would differentiate it from maybe the other community programs. Maybe yeah. talk a little bit more about how your programs are differentiated and the strategy that you all have used. Well, if, if I could talk about our hockey program for a second. the um, you know, in, in San Antonio, we have one sheet of ice outside of our arena. And <laughs> so you can imagine the challenges that come with, you know, having one sheet of ice. Um, but what, I guess about a you know, decade ago, when we, well, the Sundays that we have hockey games, for whatever hours we're open before, we offer free skate. And we also, um, you know, we're doing this community outreach and going into schools and quickly realize you know, kids don't, they don't know snow. I mean, there's, you know, there's no snow in San Antonio, much less frozen ponds and lakes. So we would take the equipment into the room and our players would come in and you know, put on the gear and then let the kids put the gear on. And, and, and it was just this whole new you know, world opened up to them. Um, and, and so the free skate became really important because they would get excited about putting skates on. And, um, that, that's been a really fun part of our programming. And then because we're in Military City, USA, sled hockey has become a real um, important part of what we do in, um, in our community. And we've had players on our sled hockey team that play on the national team. So the governing body for sled hockey has become a really important relationship for us. And um, in, the, in the basketball space. So we, we have a, a partner, Positive Coaching Alliance, and at the fundamental level for POP, the, the, one of the concerns was like, we've got to coach coaches. We've got to help them be the best coaches they can be. So we made um, a decision to partner with PCA and we became their founding partner in Central Texas and helped you know, establish and open that chapter. And we're going into our fourth year of partnership with them and they introduced, well, RBI introduced us to PCA because they were um, holding workshops in our market without the chapter being open. Um, so thank you. Uh, that, that investment has really paid off for us. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, so w one thing is we, we hear all these different strategies. Um, I, I, in some cases, and, and I guess in all cases, you are working with local community organizations that are, that are 
these ones that are these, these in-town leagues, these community sports leagues, and you're getting understanding of what some of their challenges are. And you have different strategies by which you've involved it, but I, but I wanna kind of abstract that a little bit to understand what this audience can learn from it. What, what have you learned about the strategies that ultimately help revitalize these leagues? So I'll start with you, Chris, because when you think about your involvement, and you spend time with these youth football programs, like what is the best way to make these programs um, more effective, to, to allow them to deliver a more fun experience, to build their capacity? What are, what are the strategies that you see are working the most? I, th I think it goes back to what a number of us have said up here. We've got to coach the coaches. Yep. We've got to coach the coaches in terms of the skill development. We've got to coach the coaches in terms of the, the practice structure and how that's implemented. Um, how are they presenting the game to the kids? I, I kid you not, I was at, literally at a practice at two, Saturday, or two Tuesdays ago. I went, went there and watched a varsity team at the youth level on, on this side of the field, a JV team on, on this side of the field. The team over here spent the first five minutes, three laps around the field, 25 minutes of dynamic warm-up, half hour instruction, or I'm sorry, half hour discussion, wasn't an hour and 15 minutes into the practice, they hadn't even done one football related item. And you wonder why kids aren't playing the game. Yeah. When you, well, you wonder why kids don't think this is fun. It wasn't fun me watching it. <laughs> and so I, I was appalled. And so we have got to coach the coaches. Yeah. And if we don't do that, again, like I said earlier, uh, youth sports in general, I'm not just talking about football, youth sports in general is going to suffer. Well, yeah. Lori, I'm curious for you to weigh in there because uh, how have you guys involved, got involved in coaching, education, and building the capacity of these organizations? I mean, you mentioned PCA. Yeah, but that was, I mean, that was all driven by Pop. I mean, he, he had that vision way early. Like, we've got to, you know, he, he brought his assistant coaches on, developed a curriculum early. That curriculum stayed in place for probably far too long. I mean, it just, it was so good that we didn't, you know, we, we didn't touch it. And then, you know, things have changed. Um, I think, to, you know, to your point, we, we talk about why are kids so excited about gaming and esports and stuff, and it may be because their parents don't know anything about it, and so they can just play without someone constantly telling them how to do this better and how to do that better, and, how, you know, and maybe it's not just the parents, but most of us, you know, probably wouldn't know how to, you know, coach them through their, their 2K league or, or, you know, those games and those opportunities. Um, the, you know, the, the mantra that I mentioned earlier is make positive choices and respect for all. And that is, you know, in line with our values as an organization. One of the things that we do do and have done the entire 30 years of the Spurs Youth Basketball League is have the kids say a pledge before every game. And all of our partners enforce this. And it's just, you know, a quick 30 second pledge, but their coaches lead them through it. And part of the coaches training and curriculum is to explain to them why they're making this statement and making this pledge publicly, and it's just reinforced at the beginning of every game. But then they just move on, you know, yeah. they play. Before, before we leave this, we, we talked about it, Lauren brought up this, uh, this, this concept of, of, you know, one of the benefits of esports, the rise of esports, is kids are able to run it themselves, and so they may make sure it's fun. Um, you, you also deal with parents, right? It seems like we gotta coach the coaches, but someone's gotta coach the parents about what it means to be as well. And I think you're leveraging the brand and credibility you have to do that as well, Chris? Uh, we, we like to, yeah. We, we, have, we have found that uh, by, by reaching out to the parents and, and making them aware of player health and safety issues, positive parenting choices, and how, how we should handle it, and what your kids are seeing, more times than not, uh, I'll, I'll, we have, uh, before our Detroit Lions summer football camps, I'll conduct a parent meeting. and. and uh, periodically during the, those discussions, I'll say, parents, just I want you to know that I'm at times observing you watching your kids out there on the football field. And many times when I'm watching you, um, you're in your phone doing this. And understand this, your child is watching you after they do a drill and they do it well. They're looking to you as a parent for affirmation. And more times than not, when I look over at you and you're in the phone, your, your child's thinking, Whatever they're thinking, they're probably thinking mom's not watching, dad's not watching, they don't care. And, and, and so we've got to understand and bring things to light to parents that, that you know, they're a big part of the, the, the role of, and the growth of youth sports as well. And they've got to present the game to their kids in a positive manner as well and, and not do some of the things we've all seen on the sidelines um, that happen in youth sports. Yeah. David, um, when you've focused on, on impacting uh, these, like RBI programs as an example, 
you've had a really uh, technology and data focused strategy as a way of building those organizations and giving yourself the ability to impact them most effectively. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, why that you've taken that approach, why you think that has an impact on those organizations. Well, the numbers dictate a lot, and quite honestly, from levels of support. Um, uh, our support really doesn't happen often from the cash perspective, but what we will do is we will get you the balls, the bats, the gloves, the equipment bags, but it all needs to be tied to numbers. And we used to have a registration system that was predominantly paper. Obviously, we've worked with you guys to put a registration platform, so now, you know, they can't just say, we've got 30 teams, we are, have the ability to see the registration of 30 teams worth of players. And then for those that are in club markets or working with clubs or other opportunities, uh, that's information that we can give to other potential partners for them to show what the impact is. And then a lot of times it's been a challenge in uh, some of the, the grassroots communities, but we've also taken this approach with them. Do your kids go to school? And if they're participating in schools, are you doing anything in paper anymore? And the answer is no, then you know this is the next step in order for us to get you resources that there's data there to show that your program is growing and who you are. Yeah. Andrew, uh, when you think about the, the way that the to revitalize these grassroots leagues, I think part of the question is, is if the leagues and teams are doing this heavy work to get people introduced to the games, like, like as you mentioned, learn to play, um, what are the ways that they can, what, what, how do they sustain the involvement? So they've been introduced to the game, they have a great hockey experience. What are the ways that these, these, these uh, community leagues can actually keep them engaged? So, well, stay with me on this one. <laughs> Everybody knows Bhut Bhutan, the country? I went there on my honeymoon, happiest place on earth, they said. <laughs> so, to that point, Bhutan measures happiness mm -hmm. yep. instead of productivity. We all know this. Okay. In our, pro in our programs, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily the wrong approach because it, it is important, we, we always are so concentrated on developing the athlete. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's our development to become a great hockey player? You know, we measure that productivity and, and how we're progressing people to the next level. We need to step back and measure the kid's happiness. Are you happy with this? Pro Did you have fun? Are you going to come back? This is a great time. Those are the measurements of, of keeping the kids in the game. The kids will develop. We have that down. We have our X's and O's down. Uh, when we're teaching our coaches, you know, how to coach, we've got that. We've got the structure. Um, so I think, you know, back to the point of coaching the coaches as well. You, you, What's our priority? Like, to me, at the NHL, it's selfishly, we're trying to develop fans. So my priority is that they have a good time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that they're great at a forecheck or a back check or doing this X and O play. Like, that'll happen. So I think it's to the measurement of, of, of that happiness of the kids, of the happiness of the parents. They have a, a good time at the arena and a, and a good feeling from their experience with hockey. Right, it keeps them engaged. And it's right. much, much more important to me. Yeah, so, there's been, oh, I was just gonna add, you know, there's been a lot of talk here and elsewhere about, you know, putting kids on a pro path too early. Um, but it, I think it is fun as a kid to think about being pro sure. and having, you know, this amazing career playing a game that you love. So it's a it's a fun you know difficult right. thing to balance. Yeah, everyone loves imitating that, that dream. That, those those winning shots they see. Yeah, um, I'm gonna give each of you one sentence. Uh, we have a group of people in this room that are committed to try to influence youth sports. Um, what's the one piece of advice that you would give from all the involvement that you're having with community leagues and community sports uh, that you would give uh, people in this room that are trying to potentially do the same? So I'll start with you, Chris. One sentence. What's the advice? Uh, that you how give? long can this sentence be? <laughs> one semicolon allowed. <laughs> I think I've kind of already said it. Um, there's my seconds, right? Um, no, coach the coaches, get the parents to understand the, the, the positive side of youth sports and get the kids to understand too, the, the ability to understand the social and emotional uh, benefits to sport. Laura, one sentence. Just have fun playing. For us, actually, it's, it's three words and it was the mantra uh, all year and it was simply play the game. For the game. I would say find the effectiveness of simplicity. Yeah, and I think the message I would say is, I think we heard from the previous panel as well, everybody has an opportunity to make a difference and make an impact. And so whether that's professional leagues and teams, whether that's club and travel programs, whether that's uh, nonprofits and, uh, and na national governing bodies, it seems like we can all do this. So we'll sit here next year. I'm excited to see how Tom uh, Ferry measures the lift in gross national happiness uh, because of these sports <laughs> yes. in this country. We'll add that to the agenda. Please join me in thanking this uh, amazing panel. And uh, thank you for all your work.